All right, well, good morning. Uh, once again, I'm back to preaching to an empty auditorium, which I had to do multiple times, well, a mostly empty auditorium, which I had to do a number of times during our COVID uh, shutdown. And it is nice and snowy outside. It is zero degrees, according to my phone. Uh, during the interview process, nobody told me about zero degrees, um, but we are uh, enduring the cold and hopefully you guys are all safe and warm at your homes. And uh, this morning we are going to be continuing our study in the book of James. Just a few announcements uh, ahead of time. Our uh, men's and women's Bible studies continue uh, this week. Um, and those have uh, for the women's study, that's an online study. Uh, for the men, we meet here on Tuesday nights and there's also an online uh, way to join in with us for that as well. Uh, some other things that we are going to have coming up in the next few weeks. Sometime in March, we're going to have a Saturday morning that we're calling a half day of prayer. And what that is about is about spending time, uh, some specific prolonged time on your own with God in prayer. And you might think, wow, a half day of prayer, that seems like a long time to pray. Uh, but we will have a handout that will help you through that time. It's a time where basically we will come here to the church uh, meet here together briefly at 9 o'clock on whichever Saturday morning we pick, the date's still to be determined, then you'll have about two and a half to three hours to walk through some of the handout material that we give you. You can go find your own space around the church property. Hopefully it'll be a nice day and you can spend some time outside. Um, but it's just a, a really powerful and effective time to spend some, effect, some prolonged time in your relationship with God. So that's coming up in March. And then Good Friday, we are going to do a Good Friday service as well. That'll be a communion service, a time uh, with some praise and worship as well, and a time to reflect on all that Christ accomplished for us on the cross. So that'll be coming up on Good Friday, and we'll have more details about that in the coming weeks as well. Well, as I said, we are continuing in our study of the book of James. We're going to be in James chapter 3, and James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, is all about our words. Now, do you ever wish that you had a delete button for the things that you say? Some of you could have used a delete button sometime this morning already. Now, research shows that people on average say seven to 8,000 words a day. Now, some of us are a lot less than that. Some of you are a lot more than that. But on average, people say seven to 8,000 words a day. Now, if you calculate that the average page of a book has about 250 words on a page. That means that we speak about 30 pages worth of words every day. Now, if you extend that out to a whole year, that's 10 to 11,000 written pages by the end of the year. Now, how many of you want that book written for other people to read, to be able to go through all the words that you said during a year and read everything that was there? And another thing about words, Amy and I have always joked around, we, we like to watch a lot of those uh, legal shows or courtroom shows, and a lot of times you see this on TV, I don't know if it ever really happens in real life in courtrooms, but where a, a, a witness on the stand will say something that they weren't supposed to say, and the, the judge will say something like, the jury will disregard those remarks and they'll be removed from the record. Well, you can't really do that. You can't disregard something that's already been said. What's been said is out there. There's no taking it back. Well, as we continue in our study in the book of James, we're going to be seeing the way that our, we use our words is a theme that continues through the book of James. Our words have a huge impact. And so this morning, we're going to examine that question of how can we manage our words well? How can we use our words in a way that honors God? How do we speak? in the right way. So we're going to take a look at that. Well, let's pray before we get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truth of your Word. Thank you that we can look into it and find practical truth to help us and guide us in our lives. Thank you for the truth of your Word that speaks to us through your Spirit. Father, thank you even for technology and the fact that we can uh, spend this time together in your Word uh, online. And Father, I pray that you would bless the truth of your word as it goes out, that you would open our eyes to see what we need to see, open our ears to hear what we need to hear, and give us wisdom 
in using our words in a way that honors you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, the passage we're looking at this morning is going to be James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Uh, if you need help finding the book of James, that's near the end of the New Testament. If you get all the way to Revelation, you've gone too far. If you're in the book of Hebrews, it's right after that. So you can find your way to James chapter 3, uh, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 12. And again, this letter of James was written to the early church. James was a, an important leader in the early church. Uh, he was the younger brother of Jesus. And as a leader in the early church, he wanted to write this letter to be an encouragement to uh, Christians at the time that were going through some difficult circumstances. And so he offers encouragement and instruction for godly living, and it is full of practical wisdom and truth. Now, as I said, how we use our words is one of the themes in the book of James. So I want to go back to one verse that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, James 1.19, uh, where James kind of touches on the subject of how we use our words. And then in James 3, he's going to expand on it greatly. So James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And so he's going to take this theme of, of being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to be angry. And he's going to talk more about our words in James chapter 3. So picking things up in James chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. And so James and in his instruction here starts off with a warning about teaching. Now, as believers in Christ, all of us are actually instructed to be teachers for one another. We all teach one another all the time if you're walking in fellowship with other believers. You can learn from your relationships with anybody. But that's not what this is talking about. This is really talking about a more official, formal role of being a teacher, and that it's not something to take lightly or to do for the wrong motives. The warning here is that those who teach will be held more accountable, will be judged more strictly for what they teach. So I'm just going to stop right now because I don't want that to be true. Now, you know, really, the reality is when you are called to teach, it is something to take seriously. You have to take that into account when you're teaching God's word at any level, whether it's student ministry or your small group, teaching preschool, teaching with adults, teaching in kingdom kids. That doesn't mean that you're perfect and that you have it all figured out and that you live out everything perfectly. But it does mean that what you are teaching, you're also trying to apply in your own life, that you're letting God's word speak into your own life, even as you're preparing whatever it is that you're going to be teaching, that it's something that you're trying to do personally. In fact, teaching others is really the best way to learn something and apply it into your own life. If you are teachable as you're preparing to teach, God's going to teach you through that preparation process. Now, I'm not sure if we could use this as a good slogan for recruiting other people to teach. Come be a Sunday school teacher. Come be a life group teacher. Be judged more strictly. But that's what James is saying right here. That doesn't mean don't do it, but it means don't do it for the wrong reasons. Now, James also gives us some encouragement right here, a, a reminder that we all blow it, that we all mess up in this area of our words. He says we all stumble in many ways. And he goes on and describes that if you can be perfect in your speech, then you've got the self-control to be able to be perfect in all areas of your life. If you can control your tongue, you're demonstrating the self-control that would be able to allow you to have self-control in every area of your life. And he goes on in this problem of our words, and he's going to give us a few illustrations in verses 3 through 5. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And so there are several illustrations that James is going to give here. Three illustrations. 
that are that are still relevant to us today, that are still things that we see and can understand today. Uh, the first of these illustrations is a, a bit for a horse. And a bit is really small, uh, just a few inches of either metal or really hard plastic. And a horse's bit goes in the mouth of a horse. Now, an adult horse can be anywhere from 800 to 2,000 pounds. And it can be guided by this small bit with just a little pressure on one side or the other can guide the horse wherever the rider wants it to go. And the second illustration he gives is of a, a ship's rudder. Now, rudders on a ship can be really large things depending on the size of the ship. Uh, some rudders, if it's a really large ship, the rudder itself is gonna be bigger than a person, but compared to the size of the ship, it's still a really small part. And if the rudder is damaged, a ship is directionless. I remember a few years ago in New Orleans, there was a huge cargo ship that was going through the Mississippi River and power went out to be able to control the rudder. And the ship was locked in place in one direction and ended up crashing into some buildings on the side of the riverbank because they had lost the power to control. The rudder had lost power and they weren't able to get that ship where it needed to go. And so a ship's rudder, something very small, has a huge impact on where the ship goes. And then the third illustration that he uses is a, a small flame that starts a larger fire. Just this illustration that a, a small flame, a small fire, can start a raging fire. And we see stories like this all the time of a huge fire going somewhere that started from a, a cigarette being tossed out or a spark from work that someone is doing or a spark from a campfire. And something that starts out as a really small fire ends up becoming a raging fire that is out of control. I remember reading a story a few years ago about a golfer in California who was going following through on a swing and he hit a rock with his golf club and it shot off a few sparks that started a forest fire that burned hundreds of acres and 150 forest uh, uh, firefighters were needed to put that out just from the spark from a golf club. And he had to get at least a two stroke penalty for that. Now the point James is making with all of these illustrations is something really small. The human tongue that weighs on average two to two and a half ounces can have a huge influence. And he goes into greater detail about the tongue, about how our words influence things. So reading farther on in James 3, where, I mean, again, he talks about how, so the, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. And in all of this, what he's saying is that our, our words are a reflection of our lives. Our words are a reflection of our lives. Our words reveal a great deal about us. Our words reveal how we feel, how we think, what we think is important to us. And Jesus speaks very clearly about this when he talks about the words that come out of our mouths. Luke 6.45, Jesus said this, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And then in Matthew 15.18, also the words of Jesus, But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from a heart, and these defile them. Our words demonstrate our character, our inner being. They're an expression of what's going on in our lives, what's going on inside our heart and our mind. And so we also see in Scripture that our words impact all areas of our lives. Our words have an impact on all areas of our lives. Going back to what we said earlier, if we can control or tame our tongue, we can control everything and be perfect. Your words impact your family, your work, your school, your relationship with God, the way you interact with strangers, your friendships. Every area in our life can be affected by our words. Now, as we go through this passage, the, the scripture this morning, we're going to be in a lot of different passages of scripture. Uh, don't necessarily try to write them all down. Uh, I will send out, uh, if you're on our, our email uh, list this week. I'll send out an email that's got a kind of a full list of all these. We'll also try to put an attachment 
uh, on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you want to download all of these scriptures that have to do with our words, we'll make that available to you. But you'll see really clearly that this is something that is of significant importance in God's word as we talk about how our words impact every area of our lives. And a lot of these word verses we're going to look at are going to be in the book of Proverbs. And we've talked before about how the book of James is a lot of times compared to the book of Proverbs because of the practical, real-life things that are, that are demonstrated. And so we'll be in a lot of the book of Proverbs. So the first one I want to look at is Proverbs 18.21. The tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. Now think about that phrase right there. The tongue has the power of life and death. Your words can bring life to people. Your words can bring death to people. Proverbs 13, 3, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Wise words can protect your life. Foolish words, hasty words, out of place words can bring ruin to your life. You hear regularly people getting fired from their jobs for foolish things that they have said. Using your words wisely can be a great thing and bring life. Using your words badly can cause ruin. God's word speaks to the impact that our words have on our entire lives. Now back to James chapter 3 and verse 6. I'm going to read from verse 6 through the end of the chapter, and you'll see James has some really powerful things to say about the tongue. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So the big point James is making in this part is that our words can bring destruction. You know, following these illustrations of the tongue's influence, how a small thing can have a huge impact, he gets into the tongue's destructive fire. He says it can set on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. He's using really strong words here to make his point. We've all felt the destructive power of words. You know, what's the old children's rhyme? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. But that's not really true, is it? Words can bring more lasting destruction than physical harm can. People can heal from physical injuries much more quickly than the damage caused by words. That's why people bear the weight of critical words for their entire lives. That's why children can be hot taught to hate based on prejudice-filled words from others that are repeated over and over again. That's why teasing and bullying have led to suicides among youth and even children. Words have powerful, destructive, harmful effects. And in verse 8, he said, no human being can tame the tongue. No one can tame it. And he gives this illustration that we've tamed animals. And even think about with our modern technology, we've tamed rivers, we've tamed nuclear power. But you can't tame the tongue and its destructive power. It can be full of poison, a restless source of evil, unstable. And whether our words are joking or serious, they can cause destruction. There are a lot of Proverbs that speak of the destructive power of the tongue. Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Again, destruction coming, whether it's lying or flattering, can end up causing harm. 
And then I love the way Proverbs 26, 18 and 19 reads. Like a maniac shooting flaming arrows of death is one who deceives their neighbor and says, I was only joking. I remember the first time I ever taught uh, this passage of scripture was with, with students. And I remember a student going, does it really say that in the Bible? This I was only joking part? Because that's what we hear from people. They say hateful, mean, cruel things. And then just go, ah, I was only joking. Don't take that so seriously. But even joking words can bring destruction. Proverbs 18, 6 and 7 says, The lips of fools bring them strife, and their mouths invite a beating. The mouths of fools are their undoing, and their lips are a snare to their very lives. I bet most of you know some foolish person that has been trapped by their words or a foolish person whose mouth has invited and probably received a beating. Now, we also need to be aware of the destructive influence the words of others can have in our own lives. Proverbs 13.20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. If you are around wise people that will speak wise things into your life, that will be to your benefit. If you are around fools that are speaking foolish things, that will bring harm to your life. Proverbs 17.4, a wicked person listens to deceitful lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. You know, what words do you allow to speak into your life? Whether it's through media, through entertainment, friends and family, how much power do you allow them and their words to influence the way you think about things? Not too long ago, I was at a playground with our kids, and there were some other younger kids that were there. And these were pretty little kids, probably seven or eight years old. And I heard one of them say several words that I can't say in church. And I corrected him in that moment. But here's the thing. That little kid did not learn those words on his own. He didn't make up those things on his own. He heard them from somebody else, whether it was a friend or a parent or another adult in his life. You know, our words influence people for good or for bad, and our words will often be repeated. Now, as we continue to look at things in the book of Proverbs, one thing in the book of Proverbs that will frequently happen is there will be a negative statement about something with a positive statement about something. And so in the next few we're going to look at, there's going to be a, a negative statement about the power of words as well as a positive statement about what words can do. Proverbs 14.3. Oh, I skipped that one. I'm going to go ahead and read Proverbs 17.4. We'll go back to that. A wicked person listens to deceitful lips. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. We don't want to give all our attention to words of destruction. And so just make sure you're filtering out the words that you don't want to have an influence on you. In Proverbs 14.3, a fool's mouth lashes out with pride, but the lips of the wise protect them. Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 12.18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I want to draw particular attention to the positive results of our words here. The lips of the wise bring protection. A gentle answer turns away wrath. The tongue of the wise brings healing. So you see the power of words for good, to protect, to turn away wrath, to bring healing. And that brings us to the next point, that the appropriate words, the right words in the right moment, will bring blessing and build others up. And so continuing to think about and talk about the, the positive power that words can have, that words can bring blessing and build others up. Proverbs 15, 23 says, a person finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word? Hopefully you've got people in your life, and I know I have several in my life that are like this, people that just seem to know the right thing to say at the right moment. Sometimes people will say just what you need to hear, and they don't even know that you needed to hear that. The right word at the right time can bring great encouragement. And one kind of side note on this I'd like to say, I always like to really encourage people. If 
somebody comes to your mind, somebody that you think, oh, I need to give that person a call or I need to touch base with that person, follow through on that when that thought comes to mind. Because I find a lot of times that's when I'm able to say something to somebody where they say, wow, I am so glad you called at this moment or I am so glad that you had something to say to me about that. When you get that, that urging or that prompting to get in touch with somebody, follow through on that. Sometimes I think that's God kind of nudging us to go communicate with somebody that needs to hear from us at that time. Proverbs 16.21 says, The wise in heart are called discerning, and gracious words promote instruction. When you speak your words well, not in anger or frustration, but graciously, with discernment. It promotes instruction. People are going to be more willing to listen to what you say if you say it in the right way. People will listen to you better with gracious words. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. That when we use our words in the right way, it brings life to people. Now in Ephesians chapter four, the apostle Paul gives a lot of instruction on how we are to use our words to speak truth and to build others up. Just two verses from Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 25, it says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So the value of speaking truth with one another. And then verse 29, he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So a question to ask you in response to that. Do your words more frequently tear down or build up? And let's apply this not just to the words that we say, but the words that we email, text, tweet, Snapchat, however you use it. Because here's the thing, when James was writing this, it was most likely that words were just going to be words that were spoken. Most people didn't read a lot back in James's day. In fact, his own letter most likely would have been heard by most people more than it would have been read by most people. But nowadays, many of the words that we use to interact with one another are on a device or on a screen. Do you use those words to tear down or to build up? When you think about sending that email or that message, ask the question, is this meant to tear somebody down or is this meant to bring encouragement? to build somebody up, to bring life. Are your words more of a blessing or a curse? Are your words true? Do they give grace to the people that you're talking to? Do your words bring blessing and life to others? On the other hand, do you ever use words in a way with your spouse, your kids, your parents, that you would never use with a coworker or a friend or even with strangers. The sad truth for many of us is that sometimes our harshest words are with those that we are closest to. Are your words more of a blessing or a curse? And then do you seek to repair damage done by your words? When you blow it, when you say something that gets you in trouble, when you tell somebody you'll do something and you don't follow through, when you're caught in a lie, when something happens where you're caught by your words, do you seek to repair damage? Proverbs 6 says this, My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you've shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said and snared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion. Give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. And he's making the point that if your words have caused you problems, if your words have created a bad situation for you, then work hard to make things right. And here's one of the challenges, one of the hard principles of Scripture. And I talked about this a few weeks ago when I talked about the importance of pursuing unity within the body of Christ. When you have in sin offended someone, it's your responsibility to go and make things right. When you are offended by someone else's sinful words, it's your responsibility to forgive for trying to make that relationship right, even if you never get 
an apology from that person. You might think, well, that's not fair. You're right. It's not. But as followers of Jesus, that's how we are called to interact with others, to pursue making relationships right. You can rightly and in humility go to someone and say, if they have in sin offended you, and let me clarify that that's in sin offended you, not just that you disagree with them about something, but if you go to someone who has sinned against you with your words and just say, hey, you said this, it really bothered me, maybe they'll apologize. A lot of times in those situations, people will go, gosh, I had no idea that you took that in that way, or I had no idea that that bothered you. And, I, and they'll say, you know, that was right. That was the wrong thing for me to say in that situation. On the other hand, they might say, so what? That's your problem if that bothered you. But either way, we are still called to forgive. That's how we live if we are following Christ. James makes the point that when we are inconsistent with our words, we can praise God but curse others. We say good things to some people and then we turn around and attack somebody else. We can pray and then condemn. You can be saying your prayers in church or in small group and then pronouncing curses the next day to a coworker. You're driving along, singing praise songs, then somebody cuts you off in traffic and those words can change really quickly to a different kind of words. And he uses this natural illustration that one spring doesn't produce two kinds of water. One tree won't produce two kinds of fruit. And our tongue should not speak with those kind of contradictions. So I want to run, run really quickly through some things that will make this really, really practical. First off, some ways not to use our words, ways not to use our tongue. And the first of these I want to talk about is complaining, not to use your words in complaining. There's a verse, Philippians 2.14, that says, do everything without complaining or arguing. Yes, that is in the scripture. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Think back to the Israelites. One of the biggest uh, problems that Moses had with them was dealing with their complaining and arguing about their circumstances. We are called not to be complainers. Criticizing. Don't use your words to criticize, to tear down others, to speak in a negative, judgmental way of any and every situation. Don't have a critical spirit. And then gossip, speaking about others behind their back. Whether it's something that's true or a rumor or something you just heard or something that's false that you don't know if it's false and so you're just talking about it anyway. Speaking about others behind their back. Disguising gossip as prayer requests. Don't use your words in that way. Don't use your words to cause division or discord or dissension, to stir up trouble. Scripture contains strong warnings for those that try to cause conflict, division in the church, trying to stir up trouble, trying to get people on your side about such, some issue, stirring up complaints. Don't use your words in that way. And then boasting and pride, drawing attention to yourself with your words, trying to get others to see how great you are, so how wonderful you are. There's a great proverb that addresses this, Proverbs 27, 1 and 2. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider, not your own lips. You know, don't be the person that has to top everybody else's story, that always tries to draw attention to yourself and how great you are or how much you've done. Now, in the past, when I've taught about the book of Proverbs, there's a, an object lesson, an illustration that I've always liked to use, which is I, I normally get a real cow tongue and show that to people just because it's really gross and disgusting. And I actually tried to find one. I went to like five different stores this week looking for cow tongue. And either there's been a big run on cow tongue or stores just don't carry it anymore. It's hard to know for sure. But when you use your words in an inappropriate way, to complain, to criticize, to gossip, to cause division or discord or dissension, or in boasting or pride. I want you to think about your tongue, look in something like this gross, big, ugly thing coming out. That's the way our words can appear 
when we're using them in an inappropriate way. Now I want to talk about ways to use our tongue in the right way. So a few ways to use our words in the right way. And the first one of those is don't use it. Hold those words in. One of the wisest things we can do sometimes is not speak, to keep our mouths closed. Proverbs 10, 19 says, Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. Proverbs 17, 27, The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even tempered. One of the biggest signs of wisdom is knowing when to speak and also knowing when not to speak. Now, I've known people that are the kind of people that are like, well, I just tell it like it is. I, I, if I see something and I want to say it, I just speak it the way I want, to, I want to speak it. I tell it like it is. I'm not going to keep my mouth closed. I'm just going to tell it like it is. A lot of times that's your problem. It says, but the prudent, the wise, hold their tongues. The one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. Then we are also called to use our words to encourage and build others up. To encourage and build others up. Do people leave conversations with you glad that they talk to you? Use your words to encourage and build other people up. Then we are also to use our words to speak truth in love. Sometimes there are going to be difficult things that we need to say to somebody. There are going to be hard conversations that we need to have with someone. If they're living in a way they shouldn't live, or if we need to confront somebody about something that they're doing, there are times that we are going to speak difficult words. But do you do it in such a way that your clear intent is to build others up in what you are saying? 1 Corinthians 13, he says, even if we, whatever words that we speak, if we speak them without love, we're only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So speak words of truth in love. Use your words to express thankfulness. Words of gratitude will change our own attitude and perspective, but also being around grateful people is an encouragement. If you're around people that are grateful and thankful, those are people that bring encouragement to your life. And then giving God praise. Scripture says, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Scripture is full of constant reminders to bring our praise to God. And then another powerful way to use our words in the right way is to speak the gospel boldly. That's one of the best ways you can use your words, is to share the good news of what Jesus has done for us. In Scripture, it says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So a challenging question. How often do you speak the truth of the gospel to others? Whether it's family members who need to hear the truth of the gospel, friends that need to hear the good news of what Jesus has done for them. Sadly, we probably spend more of our time complaining or griping or talking about things that don't really matter than we do looking for opportunities to speak the gospel boldly. The now last thing that I want to talk about this morning is the power of Jesus over the influence of words. The power of Jesus over the influence of our words. The first truth I want to see and want you to see in this is that our sinful words were paid for on the cross. And there's a, a big theological term called propitiation. And propitiation just carries the idea that Jesus paid the penalty, took the wrath of God for all of our sin. And in our place, put us in a right relationship with God. But our sinful words were paid for on the cross. Every lie you've ever said, every insult you've ever said, every unkind word you've said to someone else, Jesus paid the penalty for that sin on the cross. First Peter 2 expresses this beautifully. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself 
to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus bore our sins, carried our sins on the cross. Every sinful word you have spoken was paid on the cross. The wages of sin is death, and Jesus paid the penalty of death and died in our place. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died, rose from death to show his victory over sin. Have you believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? If not, you're still stuck in your sin. And another thing I want us to see this morning is that the painful words of others are also cleansed by Jesus. And there's another theological term, expiation, which means cleaning or being wiped away, being erased. That the painful words of others are also erased, cleansed by Jesus. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And going back to those words of Peter, by his wounds you have been healed. Some of us need to hear and be reminded that the painful words that others have spoken to you, words that have harmed you, have also been wiped away by Jesus. What someone else has said to you or about you is not truth. So we need to remember the words we've spoken to others, Jesus paid the penalty for those sins. They've been paid for. And our identity and our security must be found in what Christ has done for us, not by what has been said by us or to us. So some final thoughts. Our words matter. Do your words build up or do they tear down? Use your words this week to bring life to others. And I want to close with a warning and a prayer. The warning comes from Matthew 12, 36, where Jesus says this, But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Now, yes, it's true that in Christ there is no condemnation for us, but there is a day of judgment that comes even for believers. It's not a judgment about whether you're getting into heaven or hell, but it's a judgment about the works done in our life. And Jesus says here, we will give account on that day of judgment for every empty word that we have spoken. That's a warning. And then a prayer. This is a prayer that I would encourage you to pray regularly to God. Psalm 19, 14, which is this prayer like this. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Regularly make that a prayer of yours. Ask God to help the words of your mouth be pleasing in his sight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for the truth of your word. Thank you for the encouragement and the reminder of how powerful our words can be. So, Father, I pray for everyone watching this whether it's right now as we're doing it live, whether it's later on if somebody watches this, that if they've never put their faith and their trust in you, that they would understand the truth that Jesus took our sins on the cross, that he bore the penalty for our sin. Every evil word that was spoken, every evil thought that we've had, every sinful action that we've done, that Jesus paid the penalty on the cross for those sins. And I pray that if there are any watching that have never put their faith and trust in Jesus, that they would do that right now, saying, yes, Jesus, I believe that you paid the penalty on the cross for my sin, that by trusting in you, I can receive the gift of eternal life. And Father, for those of us that are believers in Christ, I pray that you would remind us 
of the power of our words, that we would leave this time with a greater commitment to use our words to honor you, to speak life, to build others up, to honor you in the way that we use our words. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for watching with us today. And I will send us out with these words, a benediction from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to prevent you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. So thank you again for watching with us today. Have a great day.